Hello, everybody, and welcome wherever you are in the world, from Romania to Rwanda, to this incredibly important session, given where we are with the COVID pandemic. We're going to be discussing innovative health technologies, which, if rapidly developed and equitably accessed, can reduce health vulnerabilities and aid resilience. The starting point is technology transfer for COVID-19. And at this stage, I'd like to introduce the UN Under Secretary General for Landlocked Developing Countries, Least Developing Companies, countries and Small Island Developing States, Ms. Fakita Mgla Koto uh, Yoto Kamunu. Welcome. You have a wealth, I know, of national, regional and international experience at various leadership roles. And I know that just prior to the UN, you are CEO of the Ministry of Tourism in Tongo. So please give us your assessment of where we are now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair, uh, distinguished colleagues, ladies and uh, gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the organizers of the WISH Summit, the Qatar Foundation, for the invitation to join you as we open uh, important deliberations into how advances in science technology and innovation to address the health and social uh, challenges of our lifetimes. The COVID-19 pandemic has cruelly highlighted fragilities in our health systems and the economic inequality that still prevail all over the world with the greatest impact on the most vulnerable societies, especially the least developed countries. The least developed countries are inherently disadvantaged given their limited capacities and their ever-increasing exposure and vulnerability to natural uh, and human-made uh, disasters. The continuing COVID-19 pandemic affects these countries severely and disproportionately from a public health perspective and many economic, social and financial disruptions it has triggered. If there's a silver lining, it is that the suffering and loss that the world has experienced has also brought our best in us. We have witnessed um, science respond with unprecedented openness and collaboration. Technology producers have shared tools and they have developed uh, in their intellectual property with multiple countries for the benefit of all people. You will hear uh, from the representative of Rwanda about how countries and first amongst the least developed countries uh, unbound by convention use robots, drones and data um, management technologies uh, to get ahead of the virus and uh, to quite successfully limit its impacts. These valuable lessons can and should be extended around the world and deployed uh, against future threats. We have also heard recently how a, a biomedical research uh, center based in Senegal, uh, capital city of Dakar, is close to producing an affordable handheld COVID-19 diagnostic test kit that can give results in a matter of minutes. The center hopes this kit will cost as little as $1 to purchase. In the same vein, uh, we were impressed by the ingenuity of the Sen Senegalese researchers who developed a prototype ventilator uh, that cost only $160, a small fraction of the price of imported uh, ventilators. We will continue to follow with great inter interest the ways in which uh, some of the least developed countries unbound uh, by convention have leveraged technologies to get ahead of the virus and to quite successfully limit its impacts. These valuable lessons can and should be extended around the world and deployed against future threats. The United Nations has played its part in addition to the tireless work being led by the World Health Organization, we are all supporting the response. Several key United Nations agencies are integral members of the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, whose work will contribute towards the expansion of broadband access around the world as key to accelerating progress towards our national and international development targets. In my capacity, as one of the commissioners of the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, I was recently involved in the work group on data, digital and AI in health. These technologies and their global availability have immense potential for population health, clinical research and development, clinical care, patient facing solutions and ultimately optimization of health services. While this progress is welcome, given the low internet access and usage in the least developed countries. The reality is that for at least every eight 
in 10 people lack the basic information and communication technology and digital infrastructure needed to access e-health. It is therefore challenging to scale up many of these applications nationally. Nevertheless, I'm looking forward to hearing examples from panelists of applications that are being uh, utilized or can be scaled up in the least developed countries. The United Nations has also launched the Technology Access Partnership to afford transfer of technology for COVID-19 relevant uh, technologies in order to reduce mobility and strengthen the resilience of health systems everywhere. There's an urgent need to do more even before COVID-19 the United Nations Secretary General's report on the implementation of the Program of Action for the Least Developed Countries for the decade uh, 2011 to 2020 revealed that LDCs significantly are lagged behind in major indicators relating to science, technology and innovation, adding that the LDCs risks being further are left behind if current trends uh, continue. My office um, recently launched a campaign called The Most Vulnerable 91 to better understand the scale of COVID-19 related funding spent so far by international um, uh, partners. One of the main findings is that there's a vast discrepancy between the global response of COVID-19, which has been estimated at 20 million, and what has been spent on the vulnerable countries. There is a real concern that COVID-19 is stretching national budgets to the breaking point where countries are having to choose between paying external debts, covering salaries for their public sector, and at the same time bracing for the potential onslaught of a public health crisis. In a statement on COVID-19, the group of least developed countries outlined their challenges and needs to address the impacts of the pandemic and how to build back better. They have called for a global stimulus package to be funded and implemented with immediate effect to address the impacts of COVID-19. This includes, among others, emergency public health package, including PPEs, ventilators, telehealth and telemedicine facilities, support for social protection systems, education support for students in the form of digital equipment, as well as educational radio and television programs, fulfillment of ODA commitments, full debt cancellation and the debt standstill. It is clear that we need significant investment in science, technology and innovation. We need to further enable the transfer of technologies between countries and especially to the least developed countries. We need to open a future in which we marvel at how technology will be rapidly uh, adopted and adapted to build resilient health systems and societies everywhere. If we do not act now, the least developed countries, which were already lagging and struggling to stay on track towards achieving the SDGs, will be further left behind. For this purpose, the United Nations General Assembly established the United Nations Technology Bank for Least Developed Countries to promote and facilitate the identification and utilization, transfer of and access to appropriate technologies while respecting intellectual property rights. It is the first sustainable development goals target to be achieved, target 17.8. We need you to be the renewable fuel in this, in the vehicle. In January 2022, we will return to Doha for the fifth United Nations Conference on the Least Developed Countries where we will finalize a forward-looking plan to enable LDCs and their development partners to deliver the global sustainable development goals by 2030. I'm confident that the outcomes of this summit will nourish the efforts towards the outcome of the Doha Conference on LDCs. I wish to once again acknowledge with much appreciation the government of Qatar for their generous offer and support to host the UN LDC 5 conference, uh, as well as this meeting. It is the mission of the summit to achieve a healthier world through global collaboration. Let us all play our part. And I look forward now to engaging with you in this panel. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. We're going to take a short pause now to see a film about the experience of one Costa Rican businessman uh, who is seeking trans trans technology transfer to make PPE for use in his country. I'm Dr. Mario Sanchez from Sixaola, Costa Rica. 
I am an industrial pharmacist and project manager at MSG Pharma, a medical equipment manufacturing company, which I run with my sister, Gerlani, who is our quality manager. In February of 2020, one of my clients contacted me to see if I could provide him with high-grade medical masks. Given the demand of the COVID-19 pandemic, I didn't have the product, so I set out on research. While researching for suppliers, I discovered some in Europe. At last, we saw an opportunity. My sister and I crossed the Atlantic and we landed in Poland. However, we couldn't do business with the Polish manufacturers without the shortage and restrictions of medical supplies at that moment in Europe. We didn't give up, we continued the search, and we traveled to Germany, then to Greece, and finally the Netherlands. All this unsuccessful. It was like hunting a ghost, and the threat of being stunted because of the lockdowns, borders, and air closures forced us to return to Costa Rica on March 13. 500,000 people had lost their lives, and Europe is now become the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. Back home, we continued the search for different options, and we decided to manufacture PPE here in Costa Rica. We start with reusable masks, but we continue to look forward for know-how, expertise, and technical details to manufacture masks for medical use. In this process, we hear about the United Nations Tech Access Partnership. Without hesitation, I contact them. Immediately, I got an answer and an interview. They contact me with Menses a Turkish company, experts on membrane filtration and technical textiles. At this point, I felt a great sense of relief that my search for expertise had finally come to an end. We worked hard together and concluded that the best was to maintain the design of our current product, adding an extra layer of the membrane manufacturing in Turkey as a protective layer. Thanks to the United Nations Tech Access Partnership, I have the honor of meeting high-quality professionals in engineering, like Dr. Ismail Kujum, director of the National Research Center on Membrane Processes. I have access to technical support from Istanbul Technical University to carry out the product safety test, and Menses gave me a section of business conditions for this project to happen in a record time of just three months. I can probably tell you that at the beginning of October, we were given the results of the particle filtration efficiency test. Our improved mask offers a 99.12% of protection, equivalent to a FFP3 of European standard. Today, we are waiting for our first shipment of raw material from Turkey to start a production of high medical mask. This will be impossible without the United Nations Tech Access Partnership. In just a few weeks, we will be ready to truly save lives in Central America and the Caribbean region. And indeed, we are delighted that Dr. Mario Sanchez, founder of MSG Pharmacy, uh, is joining us now, who is focused on delivery, as you heard there, to WHO standards. So very great welcome to you. I'm also delighted to be joined by Joshua Set. IPA, who is the managing director of probably one of the newest banks in the world, that's the technology bank for the least developed countries. He came to this new UN institution with more than 20 years in senior roles in international trade, economic policy, investment strategy and economic development at a regional, national and international level. Also, Majid Kadumi is president of Meditronic in Central and Eastern Europe, Middle Eastern and Africa region. Uh, Majid has vast experience in commercial and operational leadership and is involved in several startups. He's won several awards for achievements in business innovation. Dr. Chun Yong Chang graduated in medicine after a background in electronic engineering. He is a global health practitioner and technology entrepreneur. Dr. Chang is the founder and chairman of the Digital Health Global Initiative Foundation. And last but not least, Mrs. Tessie Rusagara is the Managing Director of Kigali Innovation City, whose mission is to nurture and accelerate Rwanda's innovation ecosystem to position Rwanda as a pan-African hub. Um, she was previously with Deloitte, um, consulting in San Francisco, uh, advising financial services clients on digital transformation, growth strategy, divestiture, and has an MBA from Stanford. So good afternoon to you all. Um, Joshua Satipa, it was always going to be a challenge starting a new bank, but can you tell me one of the biggest challenges the pandemic has given you? Thank you very much, Kirsty. The 
the reality is that at the beginning of uh, the year, when we began to see scenes uh, on TV uh, of countries scrambling to, to get hold of uh, uh, personal protective equipment, we realized that it was no longer an issue of whether you can afford, because even the richest countries were not able to get hold of uh, the PPEs. We saw global supply chains collapse, and we began to realize that for the countries that uh, our clients, the, the 47 least developed countries, then the situation was going to be even more uh, desperate. And unless we, we acted fast, we would not be able to, to, to help them contain the spread of the virus. And we quickly uh, ca called our partners, UNDP, WHO, and UNCTAD around the table and agreed with them that we had to intervene immediately in providing support to these countries to be able to produce this equipment for themselves. So we realized that the, very, the, the most efficient way to do it is to give them access to the technology to manufacture these themselves. And we set, us, set about uh, identifying technology holders, approaching them, and engaging with them to provide technologies for the production of PPEs, for the production of diagnostic kits, and for the production of medical devices. And in fact, the response was overwhelming. We received technology holders came coming forward with already technologies that they wanted to make available. And Medtronic is one of the companies that was one of the first in the world to, to make available the technology on, on, on ventilators. We saw the likes of NASA, we saw the likes of other companies come forward and say, this is what is available. And through that, we're able to provide real-time support to companies in the least developed countries and developing countries like Costa Rica to be able to pivot into the production of uh, this uh, important equipment. Yeah. And if, if, if one thing that we have learned from this is that partnerships are very important. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, Majid uh, Kudumi, because representing Medetronic, which is the biggest producer of medical devices, in a way, your own fast turnaround model kind of under your business model. So have you changed, you think, the whole mindset of Medetronic through the pandemic? Well, look, you're, you're right. The intent was to react in unprecedented times with an unprecedented reaction as well. Uh, that is untraditional. And for us as a technology company, our most valuable asset is our intellectual property and our innovation. But it is also the most valuable to our customers, and so especially yeah. in difficult times like the times we went through. You know, it's, it used to uh, uh, truly be emotional to every one of us in the company uh, that no matter how hard we try, by doubling, tripling, and quadrupling our production in a few weeks, giving all of our production uh, strength into prioritizing equipment uh, and ventilators that can be used uh, to help our partners in the healthcare systems who were going through tremendous amounts of pressure and really didn't need to add an additional layer of supply issues. So for us, uh, it, we could not, no matter how much we tried, we could not relieve these systems uh, as much as we would have liked to. And, uh, you know, I am personally a strong believer that uh, when you do things in good intention, that it pays you back in multiple good ways. And it, I, I'm lucky as much as uh, the other 100,000 uh, people around Metronic who, who are in the company working uh, to treat millions of people every year, uh, that our mission makes it really easy for us to make such important decisions and contribute to society. So for us, the intent was to really bring our strength or our main asset, uh, make it available for every engineer, every production uh, facility around the world that can help us produce more units and can bring important relief that these healthcare systems needed at the time of need. Um, so it, it was an easy decision to make for our extra and our Yet, I think what came out of it, interestingly, is the business model, uh, which wasn't intentional. But the reality is now we question ourselves if we should be limited to the production capacity that we have forecasted or we have built. Can we actually engage partners that could allow for us to bring our therapies into more places? Yeah. And I can I can tell you, uh, f we have 63,000 different technologies that we serve the healthcare systems with. 
And a lot of these technologies could benefit from local resourcing, could benefit from easier yeah. transportation. So and, and it's breaking down. It's breaking down the old business model. I mean, so many things are happening in a quite different way. Keeping the protocols, but just making them act faster. And I wonder, uh, Tessie Ruzagara in Rwanda, you have taken an incredibly innovative approach. You've just changed the whole way you're distributing, thinking about what you were going to do during the pandemic. Can you give us an example of what you did? Um, thanks, Christy. Um, it, it, maybe to, to give you some context, what we found, we were we were lucky that we there had been investments made prior to COVID-19 that um, allowed us to be prepared in terms of the response. Um, so, for example, um, you know, a few years ago, the government had made the decision to invest in the fiber network that would um, cover 95 percent of the country. At the time, you know, many people would have thought, you know, why do you need universal coverage even in areas that are outside um, your key economic nodes? Um, but then what that has helped us with is that once the pandemic hit, even when it came to transitioning to working from home, even balancing between working from home and um, working in the office, we were able to accommodate that because we had the infrastructure in place for people to do that. Uh, in, other, in other cases, we, uh, so even just that mindset, um, and that even through partnerships, uh, has really been supportive and has really helped us um, accommodate a lot of the challenges we face. So we, um, even in terms of testing, we started testing. Uh, there's some background noise. I don't know if that's just for yes. <laughs> but did you Am I right in saying that you were sending drones with testing materials and things? Um, so we'd been using drones for blood delivery. What we then start an emergency blood delivery. What then we started to use drones for was for people like cancer patients who weren't able to go to the hospital to get their medicine. You're then able to use drones. We use drones for communicating to the public in terms of um, what is required. Um, we use robots to minimize contact with people. Um, so it really, um, the approach was to leverage technology as much as possible. We used, um, you know, the talent pool we've been creating to be able to come up with pool testing. So we didn't have to, we had to, we could save on the cost of individual tests yeah. when testing kids weren't yeah. available. And I wonder, Dr. Chang, about that whole question of uh, leveraging technology. And actually, has it made you think differently, even beyond the pandemic, of using digital and AI and so forth? I, I think it's a, a very great idea that, uh, like uh, uh, some of the colleagues here, that uh, they can uh, try to expand the, the service by not limited uh, with the capacity. And, uh, and also, like uh, Ms. Tessie, uh, she has been using different technology to make the delivery of healthcare uh, more accessible. Uh, in our part of the of the uh, world, uh, what we've been trying to, to do is to use the um, information technology, uh, so try to track down on the on the service, uh, so that it become more efficient. Um, uh, so we basically um, use the uh, information technology to set up something like an administration platform. It's mm -hmm. basically an administration platform uh, that will help um, to bridge the patients and the technology, um, making it uh, much more easy um, to adopt and also much more efficient and is quality control. And uh, I think um, this is uh, what uh, digitalization uh, can be, uh, you know, much okay. more uh, be scaled. Uh, through the uh, information technology platform, yeah. I wonder what that, uh, the impact of that is on an, uh, an elderly population. And of course, we've all got elderly populations who might not be as tech savvy as yeah. others. How do you accommodate every need? Yes, uh, we not uh, using uh, this kind of information technology uh, by the, the so-called like uh, robotics <coughs> or AI. Actually, uh, we uh, also uh, develop a lot of silvery technologies. Uh, that is kind of technology which is more customized to uh, more senior uh, uh, colleagues, you know, and that may just use the, uh, uh, you know, uh, biometrics and life biometrics 
to help them to uh, ease out the pressure on memorizing passwords, et cetera, et cetera. And that is uh, very, very useful. Um, Mario, we saw you in the film there, an extraordinary speed of delivery, um, but it was also only possible because of collaboration. Um, and do you think that's your preferred way ahead? You have your own pharma company, but actually, is it always better, do you think, now, with your experience to collaborate? Uh, let me tell you, when academia, non-profit organizations and industry come together, true miracles can happen. And I'm a witness of this. Uh, I understand how difficult it is to produce something, uh, not just uh, EPP, medicine, and to do this in a record time, as I said in the video, the three months is a true, true miracle. Not for, not for as a business, but because we have to understand the business as a source or as a supply of a necessary item in this case. Uh, it guarantees national security for countries, avoids overpricing, and create jobs for our communities. Uh, I think getting together everyone, including the regulation in these processes in emergency cases have to be necessary even uh, before we affront another situation like this. Yeah. Well, I, I just uh, coming back to you, Joshua, on that. Um, innovation, doing different partnerships, taking risks, uh, cutting the paperwork. Um, you, you've been up and running two years, but are you changing your model as you go? We are con con continuously looking at the best and the most cost-effective way and innovative way of delivering our mandate. And we're a very small uh, organization and we will remain small. And the strength of our, st our key strength is ability to set up the strategic partnerships. So as long as we can be able to rely on our agility, on our strong network of partnerships and also our strong linkages, uh, links with uh, innovators, entrepreneurs across the world, not just in the developing world, but also in the developed world, we will be able to have access to the latest thinking, to the latest systems and to the latest tools. And this is what has allowed us not only to respond in time for uh, when COVID struck, but we're also looking at the post-COVID support to countries. Yeah. And yeah. one of the challenges that I would like to, to highlight here is that like most things in life, it starts as a solution, it becomes a, your next problem. Today, it is, it is estimated that 10 million masks are, 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 are uh, 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 thrown into the ecosystem on a daily basis. Yeah. So the biggest challenge now that we're seeing is heaps and heaps of PPE waste, which there are even uh, 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 suspicions that it is undermining even the containment effort because some of them are infected. Now, if we're getting them into our waste, uh, into our communities, they're in the streets, they're in the water systems, that then undermines our work. So we are actively in discussion with partners right now to innovate around increasing capacity around medical waste because yeah. all this additional uh, uh, supply of, of, of uh, medical waste, gowns, is becoming a problem and it, does, it is undermining all the excellent work that we've been doing with other partners since the beginning of the year. Um, Tessie Rusagar, is that in your mind too? That, you know, you have Mario Sanchez who's done such a stonking job of getting PP out there, but it, you know, does it have to be of a standard that's got to be biodegradable and so forth? Um, no, it's a very good point you raised. Um, I know we've, you know, there's been efforts in terms of the awareness of, of medical waste, but um, what this brings to light is actually just the whole, the broader issue around environmental sustainability yeah. and climate change in a Absolutely. similar way. Which is how the main focus of this conference. <laughs> exactly. For, so for years, a lot of people have ignored healthcare and building the infrastructure and re recognizing the importance of investing in it, both private and public. Um, and now what the pandemic has shown is that you can no longer afford to do that. Um, and so to the point that was just made, we now need to actually put similar efforts, not just only for medical waste, but in general yeah. for the environment and climate change. Um, and so, yes, <laughs> I do think it's bringing that to the you know forefront as well. Well, Mario Sanchez, you created a solution, but as Joshua said, you also in a way created a problem as well. Have you got your own solution to your own problem? 
yeah, of course, we're working on that. We are the first company in the world working on a reusable N95 or 95% of protection of a, of a mask. Uh, that's, that's something very innovative, you ask me. But at the same time, uh, just as you said, the standard for this the new technology to do it is behind that innovation. So we have to work together on this to make that a standard just in time with you have the development at the same time. And is that something that's in your mind too, Majid Kadumi, that actually there's a lot of work still to be done on how we not only get out the pandemic, but prepare perhaps for another pandemic? You know, we, we just don't know. And I think this has given everybody such a fright that people are now thinking, how do we future-proof ourselves? I, I think you're right. I think we need to think of our healthcare systems in totality in ways, how do we address uh, non-communicable disease in different environments, even different locations than communicable disease. I think it makes sense now for us to really examine if uh, one tertiary care hospital or site makes any sense. And if we should not provide services where someone who has the flu is not treated in the same place like someone who's, do, who's doing an open heart surgery. And, uh, you know, things like this that I think are basics into the healthcare system delivery uh, that uh, we probably need to add this to do a healthcare 2.0 in, in our uh, century. Uh, Dr. Chan, can you see new needs that are looming and that have only really come to the fore because of the pandemic? <clears throat> yes, uh, in all parts of the world. Um, we are not sure whether there will be any more uh, new infections coming along. So we have more uh, resources uh, in preparing for what? Uh, for infectious uh, outbreaks, yes. Yeah, and I, I was wondering, as part of your role, uh, Joseph Satipa, in the bank, you are obviously thinking of the future, you presumably have people that are actually looking into the idea of what you'll be called upon to provide money for and collaborations for in the future. Can you think of these experiences, how things, what you'll put in place, what kind of groups, what kind of collaborations you're looking for, what kind of protocols you'll have? One, one issue that comes, uh, that, that for us tops the list is connectivity. And I think as we've heard from, from our colleague from Rwanda, connectivity underpins everything that government is able to do in times like this. The best way to reach all communities, if the, commu if the communications network is not strong, it doesn't reach every, every one, then that already undermines the national effort uh, to rally uh, or to provide access to, to, to healthcare to, to the rest of the community. So we are working with other partners within the UN system and also outside to, to drive and, and, and then push as much as we can for the, the digital connectivity. It's central to, to our future strategies and our ability to contain uh, future uh, pandemics. Communication, one of the things that was very clear, particularly in the developing world, is that messaging and being able to reach all corners of the community and, and training them on how to contain and protect themselves beats being able to distribute masks. Information is very key. So if you can be able to get the messaging across, and we've seen the potential for, for, for connectivity. Now look at the disruptions to education systems globally. We know that over 60% of children in the developing world missed almost six, seven months of schooling. So that already undermines economic, it undermines social development, it undermines all key indicators in the uh, sustainable development goals that we're all collectively aiming to achieve. So to make sure this doesn't happen, we need to drive a very aggressive agenda around connectivity. And that is one area where the Technology Bank is going to build uh, partnerships to see how we contribute to this global effort to make internet access a, a, a public good. Yeah. Just like access to clean water, just like access to sanitation, connectivity should be a public good. And in terms of the Kali, excuse me, in terms of the Kigali Innovation Centre and the Innovation City, I should say, it's not a centre, it's an actual city. What are the primary things that you're working on just now to future-proof the same way that the UN Technology Bank is? 
Um, thanks, Kirsty. So the first thing has just been talent, making sure we have the right talent yeah. pool um, in country, um, pan African. Are they coming from all over the world? Is it, are, are you recruiting from all over the world? Yes, so it's um, we have a, a pan-African view. So, for example, some of our anchor universities, most of them have a 50% student body from Rwanda, 50% from the rest of Africa. So it's very diverse, the right kind of talent that will make us comfortable. Um, second has been partnerships, like was mentioned, um, whether with the government or the private sector in areas where we know we, we have challenges, but also where we see opportunity. Specifically, when it comes to innovation, we see ourselves as um, Rwanda is a very great place to innovate if you're trying to test technologies. Um, and we, we believe that if we continue to have that mindset, it, it continues to allow us to future proof um, going forward. Um, I, I wonder. Uh, post-pandemic, because pandemic, um, we know this this idea that it's, it, it, it affects everybody equally has been obviously proven to be absolutely uh, nonsense. And I wonder how concerned the panel is that post-COVID, the SDGs are already off track, will fall further behind and what we can do to make sure that doesn't happen, Joshua. One, one, one of the, 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 the key issues to, to avoid this is to strengthen resilience. Yeah. Resilience in the, in, in the healthcare system, uh, resilience around uh, infrastructure, and to ensure that uh, the right investment levels are maintained. Because if one thing that we saw, even the strongest healthcare systems collapsed, we saw, we saw across Europe. Uh, even today, as we speak, we're seeing in some of the richest countries in the world, hospitals are overwhelmed, patients are being flown to neighboring countries. Now, imagine in communities that were already under stress. At the beginning of this year, it was estimated that across Africa, there were no more than 10,000 ventilators for a population of 1.2 billion people. H how can we fight the next pandemic? if we do not address that. And one other realization that we, we now have is that we have to, as we make available these devices, we also have to, at the same time, provide support towards capacity building, not only to manufacture, but also to maintain. And we all focused on procuring ventilators. We forgot one important aspect of all that, oxygen. So imagine a situation where today you've got countries which are struggling with, with oxygen for patients. So this is part of all the resilience that we need to build into the healthcare system. And we've got strong partners like Medtronic that are committed to, to, to support this work. And we, in fact, one of our in pilot programs we're studying is in Rwanda and Senegal on training uh, medical uh, experts. So we are looking very much, uh, continuing to build these partnerships uh, to make sure that we also access the latest in technology, Dr. Chiang, I think, has mentioned some of the applications that are possible, and we will continue to build those partnerships. That is where our strength is, and that is how we can be able to support countries and healthcare systems to be stronger for the next uh, pandemic. Thank you all very much for taking part in this uh, key panel this year. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.